once again, another week, let's answer a bunch of your questions. Thanks to everybody who put in their questions into any of the comments on YouTube. I see them all, I pick out my favorites, and I answer them here. All right, let's get going. Sketchy Games wants to know, why aren't rockets launched in super high places? I mean, as tiny as it can be a difference, I think it would make space agencies save a lot of money. When you think about how you launch a rocket from the Earth, you have to get through the atmosphere of the Earth, and that's part of it, but you also have to be going really, really fast. You're going 28,000 kilometers per hour around the Earth. So, it's, so the bigger issue is to be going sideways. So this is why all of the rocket launch facilities are as close to the equator as you can get. Florida, uh, French Guiana, places like that. So that is the big, because that essentially saves you. It already gives you an extra thousand kilometers per hour, which is the rotation of the Earth. Now, if you move more north or more south, then you're going to lose that. So the most important thing is to be close to the equator. Now, that said, it does make sense to go higher up because then you have to fight through less atmosphere. So the best thing that you could have would be a mountain that is several kilometers high that is really close to the equator. And there are a couple of these, but the problem is, is that mountains are really difficult to drive up and build spaceports on and so on. So this is why generally you like, they like places like Cape Canaveral, which are right beside the ocean. They're close to the equator as you can get. So it's easy to launch the rockets out. It's safe. You can bring boats in to bring all the material in. So that's why places like Cape Canaveral are the best places for rocket launches. Marcus Felipe Pavani. Is it safe to bring samples uh, from Europa back to Earth? Wouldn't we contaminate Earth with Europa's life? If Europa does have life and it's somehow in the water, we have water here. So yeah, bringing life from Europa back to Earth where it could have a habitat that's very similar could be a dangerous thing. Although, you know, the chances of Europa's life being able to compete with Earth's life in the oceans, which, it, you know, our life evolved in it might be tough, but still better to be safe than sorry. So one of the really interesting ideas that I've heard is that you actually go and bring samples to the International Space Station. So they never get to Earth, and that's a really great use for the astronauts up in space to study these life forms that are found on other worlds in a way that you can never bring them back down. I mean, if, this, if somehow the space station stopped being in space and crashed into the atmosphere, it would burn up and would burn up all the samples. So that's actually a great use for the International Space Station. Johan1994 Carlson. Let's say a warp drive is developed and we build a ship that can move 10 times faster than the speed of light. What would happen if that ship is hit by a particle? So the whole point about a warp drive is that it warps space. And so you would have all the space around you moving with you. So I guess in theory, you wouldn't be getting hit by a particle because you're warping space. As soon as you're moving in space, that's when particles would hit you. But it, I mean, the idea of a warp drive is so far-fetched that we don't even know how they're gonna work and then we don't even know how you're gonna interact with the environment around you. So, we don't know. Stephanie, can a spacecraft traverse the solar system by waiting at one Lagrange point and make low energy hops to a passing or overlapping Lagrange point as various masses orbit the sun or each other? Yeah, this is one of the coolest things that's been figured out by, for space exploration, which is that throughout the solar system, there are these overlapping Lagrange points. And so you could do exactly what you said, which is that you could move from being in orbit around the Earth or being at the Earth's Lagrange point, and then just catch these nodes as they come around and really traverse the entire solar system with very low amounts of energy. In fact, there's a name for this, it's called the Interplanetary transport network. And so you can imagine in the far, far future, there's people making very fast trips to other planets, but also there could be these great big orbiting cylinders that just take the slow way. And so if you, you know, you don't want to use up a lot of energy, you can just follow this transport network and make your way from Saturn to Earth or back again, whatever you want to do. So actually it's a really exciting idea. I'm probably gonna do a video on it. Perfect dark. If not Mars, what planet should humanity colonize? Yeah, so I'm not as excited about Mars as maybe Elon Musk. Uh, not that I don't think we should colonize Mars, we definitely should. I'm just not sure we should colonize it first, but then he's all Elon Musk, he runs a uh, rocket company, so who might argue with him? But, uh, you know, my concern is that we're not really sure what the long-term effects of low gravity on Mars are gonna do to the human body. 
you know, or can children be born? Can you actually have generation after generation? We have to figure this stuff out. And so personally, this is just my opinion. I think that we should probably stick to close space around the earth with some kind of orbital colony. Build some kind of O'Neill cylinder, something that's orbiting, turning, that can you can create artificial gravity and then we can, you know, test what levels of artificial gravity cause the least impact on human beings. They'd be relatively close, maybe put them into lunar L4, L5 Lagrange points so that they're you know, fairly stable to get to, and we can just figure out what it takes to survive in space. So that's my opinion. That's where I think we should colonize next. Uh, and hopefully we do both. Alex W says, try it again. Oh, irony. Alex W says, I'm amazed that you do all these in one take without stuttering or stumbling. Uh, you, you have no idea how many mistakes I make and uh, how big the blooper reels are. We release the bloopers to the patrons so that they can share in my shame, but uh, yeah, no, I don't do this all in one take. I make all kinds of mistakes. That's what editing's for. Mantis Cathleris. What planned future space missions are you most excited about? Well, I'd say in the short term, I am most excited about the James Webb Space Telescope because it's going to be able to push right back to the very edge of the observable universe. Uh, that's going to be really kind of amazing. And then from that point on, I would love to see the upcoming uh, missions that are going to be going to Europa, uh, some of the new Mars landers that are in development. And I would really like to see a sailboat on Titan. But the other part that I'm really excited about is a lot of the ground-based observatories that are getting built that are going to rival the capabilities of these space-based observatories. So we've got the Large Synoptic Sky Survey, which obviously I, I never shut up about. We've got some of these new giant telescopes, the Magellan Telescope, 30-meter telescope. These things are going to be as good or way better than Hubble, and they're going to be here on the ground. So I'm actually really excited about these. Remy Andri. What would it take to build an artificial magnetic field for Mars? Is there any way of reheating Mars core and restarting its natural magnetic field? Yeah, so when we talk about colonizing Mars, you know, back to what I talked about earlier in this video, the big problem of Mars is low gravity, but the big, big one is the fact that it has no natural protection from radiation from space. The Earth's magnetosphere protects us from all these particles and stuff from the sun, while Mars, you would just be exposed on the surface. So what can you do about this? Uh, live underground, so you're, you know, you're protected by the rock and earth around you, or try to generate some kind of artificial magnetic field. The problem is, is that generating a magnetic field is gonna be really, really tough. It's gonna take a ton of energy. Magnetism falls sort of over, over large distances. Uh, the amount of power you can get out of your magnetism goes down and so it would be very, very expensive and probably not give you a lot of protection. In fact, NASA has actually experimented with this as an idea to protect spacecraft and so far uh, they really haven't found that it's going to be very useful for long-term space exploration. So that's a problem. Can you restart Mars core? I don't know. Uh, that, that sounds like sort of geoengineering at a massive scale. What would it take to restart the core of a entire planet and maybe Mars has never had a sort of turning core in the way that the earth does that generates our magnetic field so it might just be that there will never be a way to generate a permanent safe magnetic field that would let you go out onto the surface of Mars future Martians are always going to have to have some kind of suit protection they're going to have to have some kind of tunnels and they have to really limit the amount of time they spend out on the surface of Mars Bernard Rabinold, if a comet was coming straight for us from the Oort cloud, how much time would we have until impact once we spot it? We've talked about how uh, NASA is mapping out all of the asteroids in the solar system, all of the Earth crossing asteroids to really find out which ones are going to cause us any danger. But there's this whole other class of objects, which are the comets, the long period comets, the ones that are coming out from the Oort cloud. And the bad news is that if we actually spotted a long period comet that was coming towards the Earth, we would only have a few months to maybe a couple of years if we had really good observations 
to be able to prevent it. And the way this would go is we would spot this comet, we'd think maybe there's a chance, and then over time we would get better analysis of it, and then we'd realize that in fact, yes, it is gonna strike the Earth, but then it's pretty close. So we actually don't have any solutions to stop these long period comets. We need to be out in space, we need to practice methods of, of intercepting these comets and trying to divert them. And this is something that we're just gonna have to practice. Chicago Piano. Uh, my brother and I saw something in the sky that we couldn't explain. So my question is, do you believe in UFOs? You know, you saw a UFO. You saw something that was unidentified. It was flying and it was an object. So do I believe in that? Yes, I believe in that there are things we don't know what they are and they're flying in the air. And, you know, until you actually go and find out, then maybe it turns out to be a balloon or it turns out to be an aircraft or it turns out to be Venus, things like this. Do I believe that it's aliens? No, I don't believe that aliens are sending spacecraft to Earth and are visiting and flying in our sky. In fact, when you think about the number of cell phone cameras that are out there now, you would think that the number of UFO sightings would go up, but they haven't. So people now have a camera in their pocket that would be able to show them UFOs. We don't see them. So I think it's any other explanation but aliens. Mike Thompson, could you launch a small object into space using a giant slingshot? Well, sort of. So the problem is, is that if you tried to give something all of the escape velocity instantaneously, you could just imagine the g-forces that would be involved, that you would have to take something that's going from zero to 28,000 kilometers per hour, and it would have to go through the atmosphere, which is when things re-enter the atmosphere, it's, the, it's that in reverse, right? They're going 28,000 kilometers per hour, they enter the Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere heats up, slows them down, and then they're able to land. So if you did the opposite and just smack something into the atmosphere from within it, it would just explode. So you couldn't use a slingshot, but there are ideas that you could actually have like a big, long tube that was, that was a vacuum, so you had no air inside of it, and then you accelerated the thing up to orbital velocity and had it get high enough above the Earth's atmosphere that you could just shoot it off into space. It's called a railgun, and it could work. And in fact, if it did work, it would make getting to space a lot cheaper. So let's hope that someone figures this out in the future. Google's 989, would a black hole fall apart if its rotation completely stopped to a halt? Nope, no, in fact, you know, bl all black holes are rotating and the only limit on their rotation is relativity. If, they, if there was no such thing as relativity, black holes could just rotate faster and faster and faster and faster and they would just tear themselves apart. But the reason that they don't tear themselves apart is because literally the laws of physics stop them from being able to rotate any faster. But if you just had a black hole just stop rotating and just sat there, nothing would happen. It would just still act like a black hole. So, nope, can't kill them that way. Keep trying. All right, well, thanks for all your questions. That was awesome. So once again, just post your questions into the comments and I'll get to them on a future episode. If you saw the questions were short, so shorter questions have a much higher chance than big, long, multi-part questions. Just, you know, just putting that out there. All right, thanks. We'll see you next week. When you think about what it takes to actually get into space, there's a bunch of issues that you have to deal with. One is that you have to make it through the atmosphere of space. Well, through the atmosphere. All right, let me try this one more time.